Welcome to Winner Take All. I'm Alex Mosed. And on Winner Take All, we talk about the constant battle between large tech monopolies and traditional incumbents. First topic for today is Google Cloud finally released their expenses or what they're spending on their business. They're very reticent to disclose much information about their different business units. And so um, slowly they will give you little updates along the way. Thomas Curian is the head of Google Cloud. He's basically the number two guy at Oracle. When Larry Ellison would leave their keynote conference because he was racing his boat in the, in the San Francisco Bay. I mean, not a small race. It was the America's Cup. But anyway, it's the keynote presentation. And the America's Cup is going on. It's, I think, like the final day of the America's Cup. And uh, I mean, Larry's big into into you know uh, racing sailboats. So Larry skipped out on the keynote, and Tom Curian is the guy who who did the uh, who did the presentation on his behalf. So that guy is who Google swept away from Oracle and brought in to run Google Cloud a few years ago. They've given him a big budget to. Um, use M&A as a mechanism to accelerate their catch-up in the cloud storage business. The interesting thing, though, and I actually was just talking about this on Bloomberg a couple days ago, and we were talking about um, that you're actually seeing a winner-take-all dynamic in cloud storage. You know, you'd kind of think that it was more of a linear utility servers, but what you've actually come to see is I think you've started to really see um, the top one or two players followed by Google Cloud, which is actually a somewhat distant third here. So these are global cloud infrastructure stats for 2019. So this includes Alibaba, but obviously that's not relevant in the United in, in the US market here. But uh, for cloud storage, AWS globally at 32%. Azure for Microsoft had 17%, and then Google Cloud was 6%. So pretty far behind. This is from 2019. Google Cloud has had faster growth rates than the other competitors, but the other competitors are much larger, right? So that, what that's saying is in 2019, Microsoft is basically three times the size of Google Cloud. And uh, AWS was over five times the size of Google Cloud. So Google Cloud isn't gaining that much ground to dethrone Microsoft, I think anytime soon, frankly, from the number two spot, certainly, you know, much farther away from uh, the number one spot here. But they've been spending on a series of acquisitions that they've been making here. Their biggest acquisition was a company called Looker, and that was for $2.6 billion dollars. Uh, but they've had a bunch of other small ones. So just to list off a few here, in 2019, they acquired Aluma, which helps with cloud migration, Elastifile, which helps with managing your enterprise uh, storage, you know, your file storage on the cloud, Cloud Simple to help with your VMware support. And then they have Looker, which was the big uh, kind of big data, kind of analytics cloud service. So, which provides a lot of you know additional kind of value added services uh, on top of the cloud storage that you're using. Looker was 2.6. They haven't disclosed the other handful of acquisitions they've done, but let's say they're spending say close to four billion dollars in acquisitions. You don't really know, but they have released again what they are losing finally on on their cloud storage business. So they lost a little over a billion dollars uh, in just Q4 on their cloud business. Here are the stats. So Google's cloud unit, Google Cloud sales were 3.8 billion for the quarter, so 13 billion for the full year. Compare that to 57 billion of ad revenue in just the fourth quarter. So 57 billion to just a hair under 4 billion. That's the gap we're talking about. Okay. 
uh, you got some ground to pick up for this to to really be extremely material to to Alphabet's overall revenue streams here. But these losses are pretty material. One point two four billion dollar loss in the fourth quarter, five point six billion dollar loss for twenty twenty, and that gap is widening. So a twenty one percent wider loss than in twenty nineteen. Right. So the gap is widening. I mean, the overall business is able to support it because their quarterly profit actually rose 43%. I mean, this is this is the definition of monopoly money, right? I mean, you can literally lose almost $6 billion a year, which is up over 20% from the year prior investing in cloud, which seems like it has a winner-take-all dynamic. You're just seeing, really, it's kind of a development platform and a services marketplace where you just have this network of all these different apps and services that get built on top of the development platform. And that gives you so much stickiness because now you, you know, you not only have your data in, in the, in, in the storage boxes, right. But now you've built a lot of your technology and your services are integrating into these different APIs, um, which are unique and proprietary to AWS or Azure for this matter. Right. So that's why you see Google Google Cloud buying a lot of those killer apps, right? What are the killer apps, um, just like on the iPhone, right? What are those killer apps that the iPhone really needed to have at, to, at launch to provide a lot of that utility out of the box as a standalone product, right? Uh, the texting app, the phone app, the email app, the calendar app, right? The browser, um, all these kinds of things which Apple was building. And then you get all these other third-party apps to build on top of that and, and round out and give you that kind of long tail of utility. That's kind of the platform model. You are seeing that winner-take-all dynamic if you just look at where you know, the number one and number two players are here. And the question is, can, can you split the baby? Can you have a, a market of three different winners? And uh, that is difficult, as Google knows. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually not too bullish on their ability to overcome or, or really aggressively close the gap with Azure. I mean, Alphabet has somewhat limitless money. I mean, it's, a, it's clearly a monopoly. When you got monopoly money, yeah, you can lose $6 billion a year. But are you really going to be able to catch up and, and, and catch up so much ground here against Azure, um, not even counting AWS? I think that's going to be a much harder feat. So the roughly $4 billion that they had in Q4 of 2020 was a 46% year-over-year gain from 2019, right? So if we compare that to the 2019 numbers I was going over before, they had, I think, what, an 80% growth rate on that? 88%. But at that time, Google Cloud in 2019 was growing 88% year-over-year, so compared to 2018. Microsoft was growing at 64% and Amazon was growing at 36%. So, you know, it's not like the other players are growing at 20% and, and Google's growing at 88. Just how do you shrink the gap when, when you're only 24% faster growth year over year, but Microsoft is three times the size of you in 2019? So, yeah, I don't know. I just, and is Google really, by the way, Losing $6 billion a year doesn't cover the, call it $4 billion in acquisitions that they've done. Those are, those are capitalized expenses. Those aren't treated as uh, hard costs. We also don't know what kind of potential, I won't call them games, but I will call them magic that their CFO can pull with how they are logging hard expenses versus kind of capitalizing engineering expenses and and you might amortize that over a number of years right so they may actually be spending well we know they are spending if you look at the acquisitions right dollar for dollar google is absolutely spending more than just six billion dollars net cash flow out the door on getting google cloud to where it is we know that just purely because they're doing more M&A on top of the $5.6 billion loss. That, and that doesn't get factored into the loss. Then the question is, how are they actually logging the engineer's salaries, which I'm sure they have thousands of people on this. Um, you know, and, and, and so 
You pay someone $200,000 a year. Is that $5.6 billion loss attributing 100% of that $200,000 a year? I don't think it is because I think you can, I mean, it's common practice that you can spread that cost out. You can amortize it. That's common practice. That's not Google doing anything wrong. That's just normal. It just, it's not giving you the full picture of how much are they really, how much resources are they really allocating to this? I actually think it's much, it's much more than, for example, if they're doing $13 billion in revenue for the full year, they're losing 5.6. So you'd say, okay, they're at 18.7. I think they're, I think they're well spending over $20 billion a year run rate, hard costs, dollars out the door each year when you add in everything. And I'm sure they're you know, there's other business units, there's other P and L's that, you know, okay, yeah, let's put let's put that hundred million over here and let's put this hundred million over there. Yeah. Uh, nothing wrong with that. It's not illegal. It's just it's just how they play the game. Um, so I would not be surprised if they're well over 20 billion on a on a kind of run rate of cost uh for this business. And I don't know if it's really going to pan out how they think. They should know this. They're platform gurus over there, but uh, we'll see. Uh, I'd put my money on Microsoft and Amazon holding on to pretty strong number one and number two slot than I would on Google coming from behind and beating them or closing the gap aggressively on Microsoft. You really need, you really need one of the top two players to take a huge misstep, which would be in- interesting on the censorship topic, which we're going to round out to. <clears throat> later on the show okay next topic carta so if you don't know what carta is if you're running a tech startup you um you have a cap table right you have investors you have stock options that you give to employees and you got to manage that somewhere uh you could do it in excel or you could do it in carta and so carta has grown up as a SaaS business they grew up, um, you know, giving you a tool to track uh, who owns what and, and, and keep track of vesting schedules and all these kinds of things, right? Keep it organized, keep it in the cloud, SaaS tool, quick and easy. Now what they've done is they have branched, as you see many SaaS companies do, how do I go from SaaS linear into platform? And so we have now seen uh, Carta make this leap here, which is pretty interesting. They have launched an exchange to help employees and investors sell stock in, you know, in these private startups. So if Carta has all the information on who owns what and, okay, uh, hey, you got your 409A valuation, which is a evaluation you have to get done to figure out what the strike price is and what the value is of, of your private entity, right? It's kind of a way to to get a valuation on a private on, on a private company. So you get your 409A valuation and you can say, well, you know, my share was worth X when I when when it vested because I got the strike price of X. And now I just got the 409A three years later, you know, uh, 70% of my stock has vested and is 3X. So I tripled, I tripled uh, the value of those options. So the way stock options work is, let's say you get your strike price is 10 bucks, right? Let's say Y is 30, so it's 3X, X is 10. You don't make 30 as the employee, <clears throat> you make 20. You get the differential, right? So the strike price is 10, and then you make everything on top, right? So you say, hey, the company is worth effectively $10 a share today. I'm going to give you... Uh, that or it's going to have a vesting schedule, et cetera. And then, hey, employee, everything that we appreciate on top of that, the value we create beyond what we are worth today, $10 share price, that's what you will get a stake in, right? So uh, essentially Y minus X, so 20. And then what Kart is saying is, hey, employee, your shares are now worth Y and you're in the money. You got 20 bucks in the money. Maybe Alex over here would like to give you um, $15, right? Or I'll pay uh, effectively $25 a share. You, employee, will walk away with a $15 gain um, on that option. And, you know, it's you get a little bit of a discount, I do, in this scenario, to the 30 because 
it's illiquid, you know, I'm not getting control, right? You know, it's kind of a lot of provisions in there, whatever it is. Um, so you come in at 25. And now what Carta is doing is creating a marketplace to enable those deals to happen, to match these buyers and sellers, to help uh, employees and founders and, and investors that want to get some liquidity um, out of an illiquid investment, i.e. startup investing. So that's pretty interesting. You know, that's a SaaS to platform evolution. And it's really interesting how they were able to kind of bolt that on. But I guess it makes sense because they had all the data. You know, they had eyes on all the inventory and they had eyes on how much the inventory has appreciated. And then, you know, they could essentially act as a market maker. And maybe they were just doing this manually to get it going initially. And then they started to build tools around it. Uh, would be kind of seemingly, uh, you know, a common way that a lot of startups do things, right? Kind of hack it manually in an unscalable manner, get some traction, and then start to automate it and build some tools around it. So there are multiple other kind of secondary marketplaces is what you would call this. The company is up against other incumbents. NASDAQ, pri NASDAQ private market, Morgan Stanley Shareworks weren't the, the things that came to mind to me initially. But these other startups here, shares post, so they take a 5% take rate um, on the sale. Equity Zen, Zen Bato. Uh, and I guess, oh, so Carta's calling this Carta X. They're undercutting some of their competition, taking a 2% take rate instead of the 5% take rate. Carta launched the exchange using its own stock on its new exchange. So yeah, there you go. So they, they kind of use themselves as a guinea pig. It's a great story. Everyone wants to be that platform model. Always chasing the platform model. I wonder if this was part of the plan initially or they kind of just got in there and saw the opportunity as, as they started to get more scale. So they've got 18,000 customers here, which are really for their SaaS business. The nice thing is that many times when you see companies make the shift from SaaS to platform, um, it can be in conflict with the original SaaS model. You see this with a lot of these like SaaS tools for marketplaces. You know, they say, hey, here's a SaaS tool. I'll give you all this marketplace uh, and, and technology to go get all your own third party sellers. And then they say, oh, and, and, and that's a SaaS tool. But then I've got this marketplace as a service, mass, you know, marketplace as a service offering, which gives you the software and I'll bring you the third party sellers. Right. And so, you know, those things are directly in conflict with one another because your SaaS offering is helping a retailer or a distributor spin up its own marketplace. And then and then that retailer distributor is responsible for attracting its own sellers. But then it owns those sellers and all the data from those sellers and all the inventory that the sellers are putting into this kind of endless aisle experience. Then if you let the same company provide you a marketplace and service solution and bring suppliers to the table as well, you know, those things are now in conflict with one another. You could say they are additive, but at the same time, they're conflicting because you could have the same seller in the marketplace as a service offering and in the SaaS offering that the retailer has tried to attract for themselves. How do you handle that conflict? This is not as much in conflict. If anything, what I would say is, it should put pricing, it should give Carta the ability to lower the price of their SaaS tool. Not saying they have to, but um, should I allow Carta to lower the price of their SaaS tool because now they can make more money on the, on the platform core transaction, the 2%, um, you know, the, the take rate on the sale of the shares. I mean, there's much more money in that if you can really get that that kind of secondary marketplace going to compete against that you know what i suppose you will see is the, the companies that are doing marketplaces they now need to get into the SaaS business and they need to start giving that SaaS offering that um uh that cap table as a service offering away for free that's the only way to compete here right because otherwise now carta's got a nice funnel they've got a big uh valuation private valuation they can raise a lot of capital how do these other marketplace players um, you know, they need to now aggressively attack the SaaS model uh, and Carta is attacking the marketplace model by undercutting the price of the marketplace model. So can the marketplace competitors undercut the SaaS model? We'll see who undercuts whom first. But when platforms compete, guess who wins? 
the consumers and the producers. That's right, and you're seeing it play out right here. So, very interesting story. Another platform lesson that we talk a lot about on the show is the power of the platform conglomerate and how you can see, you know, when you have a number one and a number two, if the number one player can branch out to be a conglomerate, platform conglomerate, which means you're stacking different platform business models on top of each other, right? As we've talked about Uber doing in the past here. And now you can see then the resiliency that that brought to Uber in COVID, right? It wasn't just ride sharing. It was ride sharing and ride sharing and primarily Uber Eats. Um, but then also Uber Freight and some other things, right? But really, Uber Eats now has overtaken in GMV the ride sharing business because of COVID and lockdowns and all this kind of stuff, right? So that duality and that diversification not only makes the business overall stronger, but you also share a lot of synergies by cross pollinating these ecosystems, whether it's consumers. That can both, you know, do ride sharing and order food, as well as actually on the producer side, right? You've got drivers uh, that can help deliver the food and also um, deliver passengers. So very interesting stuff in terms of just kind of the the rise of platform conglomerates that we're seeing in that uh, that kind of sub hundred billion dollar market cap arena. You know, you could kind of call them like. Normally, you would call them large cap stocks, but relatively to platform size, they're kind of like mid cap. Um, no offense to other large cap stocks that are 100 billion market cap. But in the platform game of the world of modern monopolies, $50 billion market cap is not that big, relatively, right? We, so, um, we see a bunch of M&A in that 20 to $50 billion range, like Salesforce buying Slack, for example. It, a, a meaningful, a big number, but relatively to Salesforce, not that big. Back to Uber. So here they bought another marketplace business called Drizzly for $1.1 billion. I think $900 million in, in uh, stock, and I think $200 million in cash. The interesting thing about this deal is that the business model in liquor is very different than the business model in Uber Eats. So while you might say that these are kind of the same thing and they're, they're actually pretty different. And the reason why they're different is because of laws. And there's a lot of laws when it comes to restricted products like booze or, um, you know, drugs, prescription drugs, tobacco, right? All these kinds of things. So the, the distribution um, practices, right, from manufacturer to distributor to retailer to customer, all very regulated. And Amazon has tried to play in the liquor delivery space many times, actually, and, and they've had to kind of retreat uh, and retrench. And the reason why is because Amazon kind of likes to do things the Amazon way. Um, they don't really like to change the core operating model. Uh, they don't do that lightly. And so that doesn't jive with, uh, with liquor delivery. So the business model for Drizzly is very different. So Uber Eats is taking 15 to 25% of that transaction of, of that meal that you buy, depending upon who you ask. If you ask the, if you ask that, if you ask the restaurant, they're taking at least 25, if not 30%. If you ask Uber, they're taking no more than 15%. So Whatever it is, that's their business model, right? Primarily, they take a take rate on the GMV on, on that transaction. This is different. You actually can't take a take rate like that in Drizzly's business. So what they're doing is they're actually charging the retailer. So they're picking up and delivering more like Instacart is, where Instacart is, you know, is, is picking up from the grocery store and then delivering. This is kind of more like Instacart than it is like Uber Eats uh, with some differences. And this also news comes with the fact that um, Instacart is expanding horizontally into areas like liquor delivery and prescription drug delivery and these other areas. So my theory on this is that I don't know if Uber was the originator of this deal. I actually wonder if Instacart or DoorDash or someone else tried to kind of 
by uh, Drizzly first. And Dara said, no, we're not letting that happen. I, I don't know if this was Uber originated acquisition of Drizzly. Reason why I say that is it's a pretty penny, $1.1 billion. Drizzly has three and a half x their GMV um, in 2020. They just raised $50 million of August of 2020, right? So I don't think they were going into the end of last year saying, let's run a process, let's sell, right? I kind of feel like they were approached by maybe one of the other aggressors nipping at Uber's heels, Instacart, DoorDash. And then Uber said, nope, we're not letting this happen. You know, they tried to buy Grub. That deal didn't go through. They've got a little war chest here. Maybe, maybe, maybe Uber did originate it, but the price was definitely a result of multiple bidders. This wasn't just a, a one bidder kind of deal. There's multiple bidders in on this transaction. And so the business model of this is different. And that's why it doesn't, it doesn't fit like a cookie cutter into Uber Eats' business model. You're charging the retailer. Now, there's some theory here, if you read this article, this is part of predetermined strategy for Uber to branch out into a new business model where they're launching all these kind of value-added services to the retailer, right? Which is essentially how Drizzly's business model works. They're essentially kind of, they're bringing orders, they're helping with the fulfillment in different ways, they're bringing technology into these uh, liquor shops. And it's that different model, catering to the retailer and, and getting kind of these different fee structures out of the retailer as opposed to kind of a, a purely take rate driven business. So it's an interesting deal. Yeah, I mean, it has been very, it's been a very advantageous run for Drizzly, 350% in the past year. Wow. Well, people got nothing else to do. So they're drinking booze and they don't want to go to the, they don't want to go to the liquor store. There you go. Another smaller competitor to Drizzly is Minibar. So it'll be interesting to see if anything happens there. But Minibar has built a pretty nice business as well. They've been in it kind of similar timeline that Drizzly has been in it. So curious to see uh, if, you know, because again, I think there was multiple bidders here to get it to get it to this price. I think it was a pretty, pretty healthy price on the on the business, given the given the revenue model, right? It's not as sexy of a monetization take rate take rate's amazing you love take rate right that's kind of the pure marketplace model this you're not you're not eking out as much revenue for gmv that you can in a take rate model with when you have to charge the retailer um for different fees and these kinds of things right it's just your gmv to revenue ratio you're taking a 25 percent take rate that gmv to revenue ratio is 25 percent Pretty sure that Drizzly is nowhere near a, a 25% GMV to revenue ratio. It's just, it's just not possible when, you, when, when your business model is so different. So I think it's a much wider disparity between GMV and revenue, which means just from uh, the margins and everything that, that, that happens thereafter, if you got a lower uh, ratio, then you, know, you got less meat on the bone to work with. So I think the founders you know, and, and the employees here did very well. Investors, I think, did very well. Um, and, and this probably isn't done because I think you're just seeing so much activity get into this space that I think, you know, mini bars probably, uh, they're not already in talks. They're, you know, they're probably dialing that all in right now. Um, so pretty interesting here. And another win for a platform conglomerate, being able to justify beating out presumably the other bidders because they have that platform conglomerate status, right? Because they can cross pollinate all these other consumer side, demand side synergies and supply side synergies potentially on the fulfillment, right? With this business called Drizzly. And so that means that they can just justify being the highest bidder because they can get the most synergy. They can scale the business the most aggressively, another feather in the cap of Dara. I think a, a smart move. But, uh, but, you know, goes back to their platform congl conglomerate positioning as to why they can pull this off. So... Second to last topic, how does Robinhood make money? Hmm, on the topic of money. Um, 
So, you know, there's been some articles on this. I've kind of known this for a while. And, you know, it's like a free trading app. Well, how does that work? So there are these market makers. That's why you hear the name Citadel so much. But there's other versions of Citadel out there. And Vlad in his interview with Elon, which I could, you know, maybe I can play a little bit for it if I have the time here. But they aren't actually going end to end on those transactions. Citadel is really the one who's, all right, Robinhood gets the trade. And then Citadel is really the one executing those trades. And the way Robinhood's able to do this free is this. There are rules by the SEC and by FINRA that say you have to have kind of like a, you have to give the, not the lowest possible rate, but a low, you know, you have to do benefit of the doubt. You have to do your best effort to get a reasonably low price on the trade, right? Uh, so if the share is selling for a dollar a share, you can't charge them a buck fifty. But you got to be pretty close. What pretty close usually means, just for the sake of an example here, is let's say you got like a three cent variant on that share. And if Citadel can get it one cent below, you know, that goes to the buyer, to the consumer, to Alex buying his share on Robinhood. Then, okay, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm within the three cent variant. I've, I, actually, I actually saved Alex a penny. But then what if there was actually two other pennies there? Because, you know, you're still within the three cent kind of uh, window that is legally acceptable by the regulations and all this. Well, then, you know, maybe Citadel can keep those two pennies. Still within three cent variants of the lowest price at that moment, so you're still complying. Alex saved a penny, so Alex should be happy. And then Citadel's happy because they get their two pennies. But then, you know, Robin Hood and Vlad is saying, Well, where's my penny? And and then Citadel says, You know, maybe we can work out a deal here, Vlad. And because there are other companies, there are other competitors to Citadel. So Citadel will say, you know what, Vlad, if we get right of first refusal, if we get the first look at the stuff coming through Robinhood, or let's say at least 60% of the stuff coming through Robinhood, well, Vlad, I'll split my pennies 50-50 with you. I'll give you half of my cut, right? And, you know, Citadel and the other kind of market makers like them can figure out how much margin they want to give back to the, to the, to the retailer in this sense, you know, to Robin Hood, the, the, the retail brokerage. But the market maker is cutting Robin Hood in on that margin. And that margin, by definition, is really coming at the expense of me, the unsophisticated retail investor, which, which kind of seems counter to Robin Hood's whole notion, right? Is like Robin taking from the rich, giving to the poor. Retail investors, you know, I thought retail investors are supposed to be all unsophisticated, they can't make decisions for themselves. Aren't they the poor in that analogy? Um, but then Robin Hood's making money by, by giving Alex like a little bit, you know, Robin Hood's taking my penny for themselves. But Robin Hood's free. So what do you want to do, right? Vlad's like, well, you know, net net, we're helping you. Uh, more than if you were to use interactive brokers, for example. And interactive brokers, actually what I use, they take a fee. You know, it could be like a buck or it could be a little less than a buck or a little more than a buck. But I think pound for pound, interactive brokers is getting you a lower price or a better price. A better, you know, it could be lower if you're buying and higher if you're selling. They're going to get you. That's the value prop, right? You pay them a buck. It's transparent pricing. Uh, but it's not these discount brokerages, which are kind of free, which is the Robin Hood model, Charles Schwab and others. But but that's different, right? That's the kind of the difference. Interactive brokers did not have limits on um, on GameStop. And, and, and it was really these discount brokerages, uh, which are the ones we're talking about here in question with the whole shenanigans um, with uh, with GameStop and, and the meme stops. They're meme stocks is what they're being referenced as. So. CB Insights to this article, How Robin Hood Makes Money. You can basically just skip down all the way, all the way down. Okay. 
Um, now, here is the interesting part of this article. Not as simple as my penny analogy, um, but nonetheless, here is the interesting. Robinhood is not the only brokerage to capitalize on PFOF. PFOF is payment for order flow, right? So Citadel saying, I get the order flow. Vlad, I'm going to cut you in on the deal, right? And here's the takeaway from this. What they're saying here is that Robinhood has drastically higher PFOF revenue than the other, their competitive bench set, right, of other competitors' discount brokerages. Other brokerages, such as Charles Schwab and E-Trade, make money from PFOF, albeit significantly less than Robinhood. POF, PFOF, God accounts for just 3% of Schwab's revenues and 17% of E-Trade's revenue. TD Ameritrade, before being acquired, said that roughly a tenth uh, there, that its payments for order flow were roughly a tenth of a penny per share. Tenth of a penny per share, right? As opposed to a penny, in my example. Um, and E-Trade re e reported similar figures, but Robinhood has made up to 10x more from PFOF than other brokerages, according to some analysts. So, going back to my example, what would what I, you know what we'd be saying is instead of getting a penny, or that that would have gone to Alex, um, these other brokerages are getting a tenth of a penny, which means Alex now gets a penny and nine tenths of a penny. Okay, I like that much better, don't I? And these are still other discount brokerages, right? These aren't uh, the interactive broker types um, that charge much more, um, like a dollar per trade. But if you're doing more volume and higher prices and all this stuff, then you know it works out, I think, in, more in your favor, hopefully. I don't know. We'll see. Um, point is that uh, Robinhood is taking at least 10 times more. So they're taking their full penny. They don't want a tenth of a penny. They want the full penny. They kind of have to get the full penny because they don't have any other material revenue streams like these other businesses do. Then the article goes on. They've got the Robinhood Gold program where you pay like six bucks a month and you can get margin. Uh, you can get margin and you can trade with margin. And um, they, you know, they got some other stuff they're trying to get in here. But the business is much smaller. Their revenue streams are much more restricted to you know, really one or a couple things, but it's predominantly this PFOF revenue. Here's another example. Assume the average stock traded has a share price of 50 bucks. It takes 20,000 shares traded at $50 for 1 million in volume, for which E-Trade makes $22 per million dollars traded, right? Which sounds like a small number until you realize they cleared 47 million last quarter from this, right? So 47 million means 47 million in a quarter from the PFOF revenue, right? So multiply that out much more throughput, kind of like GMV. But often identical $1 million in volume, Robinhood gets paid $260. That's a lot more, Robinhood. A lot more. So if Robinhood did as much volume as E-Trade, they would theoretically be making close to $500 million per quarter in payments. So anyway, this morning, I was on Fox Business with on, uh, on uh, Maria Bartiromo show. We were talking about this and um, talking about Vlad's interview with Elon. I think I can play a snippet. So Vlad is the CEO of Robinhood. He came on this app, Clubhouse which I've talked about on the show, alternative content platform. Con alternative content platforms are blowing up, by the way. Gab, which everyone has now branded as an extremist alt-right uh, social media platform, which I don't think is fair, um, has added over 30 million new users in one month. 30 million new users. It was a top thousand website before all of this started happening. Thanks to Atlas over here. Now they just added 30 million new users. Top thousand before Atlas. 30 additional, 30 million new additional users. You want to know how many engineers they have? Five. Five engineers. They have, you know, these companies are so small that the exodus, the migration is insane. So Clubhouse also has been blowing up. And fortunately for them, they've been able to 
keep their branding um, more uh, politically neutral. But anyway, Elon started to interview Vlad. I might skip around a little bit because the guy, I'll let you make your own opinion about how he sounds. Um, and this is where Robin Hood Securities comes in. We have to put up money to the NSCC um, based on some factors, including um, things like the volatility of the um, of the trading activity, concentration into certain securities. Um, and this is this is the equities business. So it's based on stock trading and um, uh, not options trading or, or anything else. Um, so they gave us a file with a deposit and the the request was around three billion dollars. Um, which is, you know, about an order of magnitude more than what it typically is, right? So, um, no, 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 why, why and, was that so high? Like, this seems like, like, it, it sounds like this is an unprecedented increase in uh, demand for capital. Um, what formula did they use to calculate that? Well, um, yeah, and just to give context, you know, Robinhood up until that point has raised, uh, you know, a little bit around $2 billion in total uh, venture capital up until now. So it's a big number, like $3 billion is um, is a large number. Okay, here's how, it doesn't make any sense, right? He's talking about $3 billion. And then he says, well, we raised $2 billion in equity. It's, it's equity, it's, right? It's apples and oranges. This guy is smart, but he does not. Sorry, I was gonna let you make your own opinion, but he sounds like a buffoon. The guy is smart. He's built a multi-billion dollar company, but I don't know. It's got to be his lawyers that aren't letting him really talk freely. And like, they're like scripting everything for him. Cause it, you listen to this thing and it just, it, it, I think it works against him. So anyway, he's saying, yeah, we, well, they wanted $3 billion, but we've raised $2 billion in, in equity. These are for payments. This is Alex buying GameStop, right? And so if I want to buy a share of GameStop on Robinhood, Robinhood's not going to let me buy uh, $100 worth of GameStop unless Alex has $100 in his Robinhood account, right? And Alex uh, and Robin and Robinhood's not going to let Alex buy $200 of GameStop um, unless I and, and if I have $100 in Robinhood, they might let me buy 200, but then I got to do margin and I got to pay for Robinhood Gold, right? So and then maybe I could double my money and buy 200 dollars worth of GameStop, right? So that's kind of the margin trading, right? But if so, if I don't have margin trading and I want to buy 100 dollars in GameStop, the way these uh, rules work with this clearinghouse, this NSCC is the clearinghouse. You have two days to settle. You have two days to settle the monies, right? So I buy it, boom! I now own. A share of GameStop instantly, um, but the money has left my Robinhood account, but is still in motion. It takes two business days before it hits the actual clearinghouse, and 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 the whole thing is settled, is what they call it, right? So if the NSCC came in and said, "Hey, Vlad, you had, you know, we we have concerns. There's a lot of volatility here." What he goes on to say is, "Well, the price sank, um, so instead of." One share being $100, you know, or say $300, it's now, we think it's going to be $150. What difference does that make if I'm not using margin, right? So if I've got $300 in my Robinhood wallet and I buy a share for 300 bucks, boom, that money is gone. Yeah, now it hasn't hit the clearinghouse, but it's not like the money is fake in my Robinhood account. If, if Robinhood thinks the money that's fake in my Robinhood account it, then they got much bigger issues here, right? So let's assume three hundred dollars in my Robin account is legit, and eventually it'll get to the clearinghouse. Maybe the share is one hundred fifty dollars in two days, which is what ended up happening. But the money's out of my account, right? So it's you're just talking a couple days here. It has nothing to do with equity. Robinhood has three hundred dollars now. If Robinhood needs to front a couple billion dollars, which is what they ended up doing, they can raise some short term debt from their investors, which is what they ended up doing to cover these positions. But the, the equity and the, and, and the trading and the accounts, uh, listen on. We don't have the full details. It's a little bit of an opaque formula, but there's a component called the VAR of it, which is value at risk. And 
Um, that's based on kind of some fairly quantitative things, although it's not it's not fully transparent. So uh, there are ways to reverse engineer it, but uh, it's not kind of publicly shared. Um, and then there's a special component, which is discretionary. Um, so that's that kind of acts as a multiplier. And um, basically it's discretionary, discretionary meaning like it's just their opinion. Yeah, there. Uh, it's it's a little bit. I mean, I'm sure there's there's definitely more more than just their opinion, but um, basically. Well, I mean, I, I guess like it's based everyone, on growth. What everyone wants to know. What everyone wants to know is like, well, did something maybe shady go down here? Like, like it, it's like it seems weird that you'd get a sudden ten billion dollar demand. You know, three billion, three, three billion. billion in the morning. Sorry, how much? Yeah, it was three billion U.S. dollars. Three billion. Okay, three, three billion yeah, around you know, just suddenly out of nowhere. Um, and what I wouldn't, I wouldn't impute, I wouldn't impute shadiness to it or anything like okay. that. And actually, you know, the NSCC was reasonable subsequent to this. And, you know, they've been, they've been, uh, they worked with us to, um, to actually lower it. So, um, it was unprecedented activity. You know, we don't, I don't have the full context about, um, you know, what was, what was going on in what's going on in the, in the NSCC to make these calculations. So Vlad doesn't think there's any shadiness going on. That they, that they make these requirements. Then he said, well, the NSCC lowered it. So Elon asked him, who is this NSCC? What's going on with them? Right. And his response was, well, it's a consortium. Um, you know, I, I don't really know the details. I don't really know what's going on over there. I mean, this guy has a ten billion was supposed to be a ten billion dollar company. He, the way his business operates is regulated. Every morning, the NSC, NSCC sends these guys an email with their capital requirements. Every morning, you like Robinhood and ninety nine other firms like Robinhood, and this guy doesn't know anything about how this uh, organization, which literally sends him a bill every morning about what they need to put into the clearing account, doesn't know anything about it. Oh, well, that makes a ton of sense. Here they are. This is the DTCC board. You can see who their management committee is. You can see who on, is on the board, uh, on, on their different board committees here, and their board of directors. So here's their board of directors. You want to know who's on the board of directors? A bunch of bankers. You got Citibank, Citigroup around here. You got BNP Paribas. You got the ICE. You got JP Morgan, a couple of people from JP Morgan, you got Goldman Sachs, you got UBS, you got State Street, you got Morgan Stanley, you got Barclays, you got Bank of America, you got BNY Mellon, you got people from the Fed on here. These are bankers. They're on the board of this thing. And then there's a management committee and all this kind of stuff. So Elon's pressing Vlad on, well, if this wasn't your decision, Robin Hood, well, then whose was it? And then he says, well, I don't really know anything about the people whose decision it was to, to make these ar seemingly arbitrary requirements, but then they make perfect sense to Vlad, but then those requirements get walked down. These are unprecedented events with these meme stocks. And, you know, there was a lot of activity. So there probably is um, so some amount of extra risk in the system that warrants higher higher requirements. So it's not entirely unreasonable. Um, but we did operational processes to make sure that customers that had positions could sell their open positions because obviously restricting someone, we got a lot of questions about, okay, you had to restrict buying. Why didn't you also restrict selling? And the fact uh -huh. of the matter is, yeah. People get really pissed off if they're holding stock and they want to sell it and they can't, right? So I think that's that's categorically worse. So thanks for that, Vlad. Um, Genius. And lots of other brokers, I think, were in the same situation. Robinhood was in the news, but you you sort of heard this industry wide, right? Other brokers uh, basically restricted the same exact activity. All right. So so it sounds like this. This, this organization you know, calls you up and they basically have a gun to your head, either either hand over this money or or else. Um, and so, because I mean, like basically what people are wondering is like, did, did you sell your clients down the river or did you have no choice? And if you had no choice, that's understandable. 
But then, you know, we got to find out why you had no choice. And who are these people that are saying you have no choice? Yeah, um, I think that's fair. You know, we have to comply with these requirements. Financial institutions have requirements. Um, you know, the 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 formula behind these requirements, um, I think um, it would obviously be ideal if there was a little bit more transparency so we could plan better around that. Um, you know, but to be fair, we were able to open and serve our customers. I mean, they weren't able to serve their customers. When we did open, uh, well, when we do open tomorrow morning, uh, we'll be able to kind of relax the stringent position limits that we put on these securities on Friday. Will, will there be any limits? Well, I think there's always going to be some theoretical limit. Like we don't have infinite capital, right? Okay. And on Friday, there were limits. Um, so there's always there's always going to have to be some limit. I think the question is, you know, will the limits be high enough to the point where, you know, some they, they won't impact, you know, 99.9 .9 plus percent of customers. Um, so, you know, if someone were to deposit a hundred billion dollars and, and decide to trade in one stock like that, that wouldn't be possible. What is this guy talking? All right. Elon had the same reaction like, OK, guy, thanks. To what degree are you beholden to Citadel? I mean, like, like basically, if Citadel's unhappy, then I, I, then what happens? Yeah, so that you know, there was a rumor that uh, Citadel uh, or other market makers kind of pressured us into doing this, and now that, that's just false, right? Um, market makers execute our trades; they execute trades of of every broker dealer. Um, you know, this was this was a clearinghouse. Um, this was a clearinghouse decision and it was just based on the capital requirements. So um, okay. from our perspective, you know, Citadel and other market makers um, weren't involved in that. But wouldn't they have a strong say in, in who got put in charge of that organization since it's an industry consortium, not a government consortium or not a government regulatory agency? Um, I, I don't have any reason to believe that. I think that's just like, you know, then you're getting into kind of the conspiracy theories a little bit. So I just have no no reason to believe that that's the case, you know. OK. <laughs> so Elon just laughed at Vlad. Should we, should we replay that? Let's replay that. I just have no no reason to believe that that's the case, you know. OK. <laughs> that was that wasn't me laughing. All right. Um, well, I um, guess uh, so we'll see what happens with future actions. Um, hopefully, that wow. was uh, insightful or you know, at least a little bit entertaining. So that was the interview. I missed the part in here, but we don't need to go back anyway. What Vlad ended up saying is that the three billion dollar request was eventually lowered to seven hundred million dollars. Robin Hood was asked for three billion dollars. And then, and then ap after Robinhood, the clearing agency cut that down to $700 million after they put in all these protocols to do what? Limit trading. But here's the thing. I mean, they ended up raising, they being Robinhood, now they've raised $4 billion in debt, right? So again, that equity number, the $2 billion equity number is completely irrelevant. And they raised a billion dollars overnight to kind of help here. So, you know, they had to put in $700 million. Can't you just restrict the margin trading? If you actually think about what cash, you know, what cash is going on, unless this company is so undercapitalized that they they just don't have the float and 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 Vlad is just aloof and running the business irresponsibly. You know, they have the deposits, right? Like it's not they have a lot of existing investors that have that money in their wallets, right? So it's not like all the trading activity on Robinhood just came in. These were new users off of the app store, which is kind of what he make, tries to make it sound like. Oh, well, we were the number one app. All these new people got the app. Then they put money into their account, right? Which didn't hit Robinhood yet. And so they didn't have that money. Uh, Robinhood didn't. And then they did the trade on GameStop. So if that put them in such a precarious position that they weren't able to operate and 
And then Vlad doesn't think that, you know, there's any bias in this or somehow 3 billion turned into 700 million. And it, A, isn't being asked tough questions about, you know, how they run their business in a responsible or irresponsible manner and how this NSCC group uh, that can just decree these kind of capital requirements, no transparency. They haven't come out with any kind of official statement on why they took the action that they did. It just doesn't check out. It doesn't make sense. Um, and how Robinhood couldn't have taken other protocols, raised this money, which they, and they, which they did raise $4 billion, but then they still had to limit trading on buying activity, all buying activity, not just margin trading, but all buying activity, or at least like limit buying activity from new people that just sign up, right? But let your existing users who have the cash and you know they have the cash, right? Like, I, I just think there's a very wide spectrum that if, if they really cared about their mission and their value prop and, you know, what the company is supposed to do for retail investors, there is a very wide spectrum of action between free trading with margin and, and new users creating an account depositing money, getting margin, and, and doing a bunch of trading, right? If that's one end of the spectrum. And the other end of the spectrum is blocking all buying activity from new, from existing, from margin, from non-margin trading. Pretty wide spectrum, especially when you can make a call and get a billion dollars, that was the first tranche, and then they've got now four billion in total in a matter of days, right? Like there should be a spectrum of restrictions that you put on rather than going from this end of the spectrum to the complete opposite end of the spectrum and then he says oh well we let people sell their shares like he's supposed to get a pat on the back whether you want to say robin hood was in on it the nscc was in on it whatever it was it worked right the price went down the shorts and the hedge funds were able to get money out and then the price went back up because you had this pent up Demand. You know, there needs to be more transparency, more investigation. Janet Yellen is apparently meeting about this and trying to get to the bottom of it. We'll see if she ends up going after uh, the retail traders um, or the uh, you know big hedge funds and and big financial institutions which have paid for her speeches. Um, hopefully, the latter, not the former. Um, it's actually pretty easy to investigate. Go to the NSCC. Go to all the people on the board of the DTCC and audit all the emails phone calls, and text messages, which every single one of those individuals got in a five-day period of time. And you'll be able to probably figure out if there was some funny business going on here pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. The last note here is don't forget that tech censorship has also played a factor in this whole fiasco. Not, to be, not, not surprising, right? What I mean by that is... Um, you know, I've spoken about how Reddit banned the Wall Street Bets community, which is really a catalyst for a lot of this stuff. And then they reactivated them because they came under a lot of fire. But we haven't talked about Discord. Discord is a kind of chat app that started with a lot of gamers have used it. So Discord um, actually came out publicly in a statement and, and, and like fully backed up their position to ban the the Discord, the Wall Street Bets Discord community. Discord was for the first to act, shutting down the Wall Street Bets server sometime around 6 p.m. In a statement provided to the press, the social media service said the Wall Street Bets Discord server has been on our trust and safety. Trust and safety. Translation, thought police. Team's radar for some time due to occasional content that violates our community guidelines. Including, here you go, hate speech glorifying violence, and spreading misinformation. Over the past few months, we have issued multiple warnings to the server admin. Okay, gang. Every single community, every single website, every single social network, every single one of these businesses is going to have hate speech, glorifying violence, and spreading, and, and have misinformation on it. And you know what? It could actually come from people that aren't a part of the community, or it could come from all the hundreds of thousands of new people that just created an account and they go in there, or it could come from paid bad actors that are sent into these communities to spread this type of, uh, you know, speech. And then that stuff gets reported and then, you know, the community gets banned. 
There are so many reasons as to why this could come about. This is about the subreddit. Wall Street Bets subreddit, widely credited with kickstarting this, this uh, fiasco, was briefly taken private by moderators Wednesday night amid a tsunami of so many comments and submissions we can't possibly even read them all, let alone act as act on them as moderators. Briefly taken private by moderators, but one of the some of the moderators are saying that they never took it private. Reddit representatives were not available for comment. Then this guy, Rod Reslaw, started Reddit admins who confirmed that they had no part in the decision to take the subreddit private. Originally, they said, well, the admins took it private, and the admins said, no, we didn't take it private. Despite the use of special moderation software to handle the influx of attention, the Wall Street Bets mods say that the software isn't allowed to read the Reddit news feed fast enough and submit responses. And the admins haven't given us special access despite asking for it. So what they're saying is there are tools, there are bots that you can use, you know, that can, <clears throat> that can help read through all the new posts on these subreddits. But Reddit special admins aren't allowing those tools to, to tap into, you know, the news feed quickly enough to read all the information, to let the moderators, you know, vet it out in real time. So what, which one is it, right? Reddit, Discord, you're, you're saying, well, you've got this information that is inappropriate according to our community guidelines, just whatever the thought police decide, you know, how they feel waking up in the morning. But then the, the mods want to use tools, but then the platform doesn't let the mods use the tools to correct the type of information that then the platform uses as an excuse as to why the thought police are justified to take down the forum. Let me know how that one works. Maybe Vlad can figure it out for all of us when he figures out who actually runs the uh, DTCC. With that, I will leave you, and I am very glad you all joined us today on Winner Take All, and I will be talking to you very soon.